So I have a couple things to say about passing the piece. One, I'm not venturing out because I have to take my mask off so I don't juggle it with my headset and all. So, I, so I'm not um, wandering, wandering, wanting to venture out and greet people unmasked. Maybe next week, um, the way things are looking. We'll see, or maybe in a couple of weeks. I, and I also, um, I, I'm not wearing my glasses. I can see pretty well, like I can identify most of you. And you help me out by sitting in the same place, usually. Thank you for that. Um, so, but I, so I, so I, it, people look a little fuzzy, and there were people here in the uh, balcony trying to greet me, and I'm like, what are they doing? What are they waving at me? Like, like do I have like a stain or something? What is this going on? <laughs> anyway, um, I look forward to being able to venture out when we pass the piece, and, and maybe we can start even giving, giving, uh, getting, getting a little bit closer to each other as, as the masks come off and social distancing becomes less strict. Our passage this morning, how many have heard, heard of the parable of the Good Samaritan? Uh, it's a familiar passage, I think. Luke chapter 10, beginning with verse 25. Just then, a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? And the lawyer answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this, and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who? is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now, by chance, a priest was going down that road And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went up to him, and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? And the lawyer answered, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. The word of the Lord. So this parable is is set up by a dialogue, right, between Jesus and a lawyer. Now, the lawyer, what that, what that means when we, have a, when we have an idea about what a lawyer is, you know, we, we think of it's somebody that we, we go to um, for legal advice or legal counsel uh, in our dealings with the world, with the law, with, with um, buying and selling a property, with, with uh, um, criminal activity, anything, you know, those kinds of things. That's what we think of. In this case, a lawyer means somebody who is a scholar of the Jewish law. And in his own right, Jesus is a scholar of the Jewish law. So what's going on here is a kind of dialogue, 
an interaction, a conversation about the meaning of the Jewish law. Now, as Christians, we have, I think, made, uh, we, 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 we often make a big mistake, we have made a big mistake in thinking that Jesus, in telling a story like this, is departing from the Jewish law, that he's going beyond it or going outside of it. And I want to say that Jesus is well within the Jewish tradition uh, in telling the story and his, and his understanding of the law. The Jewish tradition was, was very, very clear about love of God and love of neighbor. There was no debate about that. And even further, the Jewish law is very clear about loving the stranger and the alien and the foreigner, uh, the immigrant, the person who's maybe not a part of your kinship group, shall we say, not a part of your tribe, not a part of your family, but is living among you. You shall love that person as yourself. The Jewish law is very clear. If you read in the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament, you will see the command there, read the command there, love the alien, love the stranger, love the foreigner as yourself. That's what it says. And there's a rationale that's given there because you were strangers and aliens and foreigners and oppressed in the land of Egypt. So the rationale is the rationale of empathy because you have experienced what it's like to be strangers or your people have. It's part of the memory, your collective memory as a people. You can appreciate how difficult it is to be a stranger or a foreigner or an immigrant or a newcomer. This was not controversial. Jews widely held and understood this belief. Where, where things get interesting and, and where there is debate in, in, um, among, uh, among people like these two people, like Jesus and the lawyer, is what exactly this means. Who exactly is my neighbor? How am I going to draw that circle? And so Jesus tells the story to describe how he would draw the circle and what it means for him. When I was, when I was younger, like two weeks ago, um, I, 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 I um, tended to divide this thing about loving God and loving neighbor. I really did not like all the prophetic words about idolatry. Um, you shall have no other gods before you, and uh, don't worship in the high places, and all these kinds of things that were about right, right worship, what scholars call the cultic aspect of Jewish faith or Christian faith. I was much more interested in the loving neighbor part the, re- the relationship to the other people part, the justice part. Give me a, give me a text like Isaiah 58. Um, I don't want your fast. I don't want your solemn feasts. I don't want your worship. What I want is for you to do justice, to treat your workers right, to not cheat the poor, to not add house to house and field to field. That's what I want. So I, 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 like, I, like, I, I like those justice texts and not so much the cultic texts about idolatry and those kinds of things that the prophets seem to be so concerned with. But the older I get, the more I realize that those two are, in fact, the same thing. Loving God and loving neighbor can't be parsed, taken apart, parsed apart from each other, 
set off of each other, set, set as two different things or two different aspects. They are the same thing. They are not two different aspects. They are the same thing. Loving God and loving neighbor. They are not even two sides of the same coin. They're more like maybe a warp and a weft of a fabric, of a tapestry. You can't have a fabric without warp and weft. You have to have both of them to create a fabric, to be able to weave. Loving God and loving neighbor are the warp and the weft of faith, of love. I came across uh, in the last few weeks a, uh, um, a reading that was thought-provoking for me, really changed, is cha- changes the way I think about, about this and what this means, really challenges me in a lot of ways about this business of loving God and loving neighbor. It comes from Catherine of Siena, who lived in the 14th century, that's the 300s. She, she, she was born in, I think, I think she was born in 1357. That's a long, that's a long time ago, 1357. That is, what, almost, what is that? Almost 600 years ago, or is, it, is that right? 700 years ago? Something like that, it's a long time ago. Those of you who, who are good with numbers, you can just shout it out if you, if you, can, if you got that. Uh, 1357. Uh, and she was a leader in the church um, in Italy. She was Italian. Siena's a place uh, in Italy. That's where, where she lived. And she was very active and, in, uh, and involved in a variety of ways in the church. And she, had, she wrote what she called, uh, she called dialogues. She wrote in Italian, not Latin, for what that's worth. She called dialogues. These were conversations with, with God. She had this conversation with God where God says to her, you cannot love me with the kind of love that I ask you to. Well, that's a strange statement, right? You cannot love me with the kind of love that I, uh, that I ask you to. And the reason... God tells Catherine that you can't do this is that I love you freely. I have created you and everything that you have, everything that you are is is because of me and because of my love for you. I loved you first without you loving me. You didn't love me first. I loved you. I loved you into being. You cannot possibly love me in the same way with that love freely given. Any love you, you give back to me is, is reciprocal. It's, it's out of duty or obligation. You, you owe it to me because I have loved you first. So God tells Catherine, I have put you among neighbors. You can show love to neighbors. You can love your neighbors without expecting anything in return, without profit. It's a very different way of thinking about, about loving God and loving neighbor. And so God says, in this way, you can show your love to me with, in the same kind of way that I love you. The warp and the weft, loving God and loving neighbor are the same thing. Now in this story, we have a wonderful example of what Catherine is writing about. A man is going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Now Jerusalem is about... uh, 2,500 feet or so in elevation. I think I'm getting this right. Uh, and Jericho is below sea level. If you know the Dead Sea, if how the Dead Sea is below sea level. One of the lowest, Jericho is one of the lowest cities uh, on the earth in terms of elevation. It's below sea level. So what that means is if you're going, if you're going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, you are winding, you're going on a windy mountainous road. And there are bandits. 
on this road. It is a dangerous road because there are places for bandits to hide around the bend or behind some trees or some rocks. It's scary. It's dangerous. And so what happens is what you might expect to happen. The man is robbed and left, and left for dead. And the three people, the three, there are three people who are, who are, or who are going by and, and they're making calculations. Or the two first two are making calculations. Like we all make calculations, right? Can I do this? Do I have the time? What would it cost me? It's a risk-reward assessment, if you will. And the risk is high. The risk is extremely high. And there's no reward, really, that you can see. I mean, if you stop, you're risking, I mean, those bandits, they're still out there, right? You're risking getting robbed yourself. Like, the best thing I can do is to protect myself in this situation, right? That's the kind of logic that these people are thinking. We know this. Um, we've probably all done this ourselves at some time or another. And the Samaritan, the one who's the outsider, to be sure, the stranger, the alien, the foreigner, comes on by and engages in a very different risk-reward kind of calculation. He is moved to compassion. You were strangers in the land of Egypt, so love the alien. He's moved to compassion. He has empathy. There's something that connects with him that's, that, that becomes alive in his spirit. And he responds without that kind of bargaining, that internal bargaining, intuitively almost. And that's the, that, that, that's the biggest gift, the biggest act of love is right there. So the monetary things, the oil, the wine, the, the denarii for the man's lodging and food and so on, that's, that's pretty minor in comparison to the risk of life and limb that he takes to do this and the time that he takes to do this. It's an extraordinary act. And if Catherine is to be, to be believed, it is an act of the purest prayer and the purest form of worship. That act of love binds the Samaritan not just to the victim of the robbers, but to God. It is a sacramental act. When we love our neighbors, and especially when we love those who don't offer us anything in return, the stranger, the foreigner, the alien, the enemy, When we do that, we are loving like God loves us. And we are showing our love as, as if to God, as an act of sacrifice, an act of worship, an act of prayer, a holy act. So you see, true Worship and justice are the same thing. It is sacramental. When we love in this way, we are bound together with each other and with God. We become one. Amen.